It's quite an intro, thank you very much. Um, hi, I'm Marty. Yes, I'm the founder of Vine, and um, uh, I created a language that we now build at my company. Um, and the purpose of my talk here is I'm going to talk about semantic metadata and how we can use it to create an automated data mesh. So this is, this is the title of the talk, Building an Automated Data Mesh Using Semantic Metadata. And it's a fairly punchy title, right? There's a lot of, um, a lot of jargon in there. So we're going to unpack it and explore the title a little bit. So I'm going to start off with here. I'm going to talk about what a data mesh is for a little bit. So if we look across kind of an enterprise organization, there's a bunch of different places that we can go to to get information. A bunch of services that we can query, a bunch of databases, a bunch of queues, a bunch of lambdas. All the different things that we are all very busy building in our day jobs to create things that vend information. And the idea of a data mesh is to give me a place that I can ask and interact with these services that kind of sits above it. Right? And a data layer that sits above it where I can ask for information and for data products that are, are vended from each of these things in a, in a decentralized way. So we're not talking about ETL in this, in this talk. This is not a conversation about how do I pick up and lift and shift my data into, into a data lake. We're talking about how do, I, how do I gather data from these services and let it stay decentralized. I want to query them in place. And I want to be able to do it on demand. So a data mesh is a place where on demand I can query my data services, my databases, my queues, all that good stuff. But I want to do it automated. So as you can imagine, if I'm integrating with all of these different data sources, there's a huge amount of plumbing work that I have to do. Relatively uninteresting, boring integration work. Connecting A to B, piping data around the place. There's lots of different tools that we can use for doing this, but a lot of them don't really kind of live up to the litmus test of what we consider to be automated. So there's a couple of things, a couple of tests I like to apply for, is something truly automated? The first litmus test is, can it connect on demand? Can it, can it do what I need it to when I ask it to? Or more specifically, can it do it without having someone come along beforehand to who has preconceived of my specific use case and wired it up? So if we think about integration and the ways that we do integration, the way that we solve them today, typically there's a handful of tools that we, that we will reach for. Pretty much everyone in this room will probably open up their IDE and write a bunch of code, and let's be honest, that's our preferred way of solving it. Um, but that's not exactly automated, and that doesn't scale particularly well when you've got thousands of services, lots of different things that we're trying to connect to. So it's not, it's not particularly automated. We might use some kind of drag and drop orchestration flow builder where I can pull some nodes onto a canvas and draw some lines to connect them and deploy that as an integration orchestration layer. And that's cool, there's a lot less code involved, but it's not automated, right? When someone comes along with a new requirement, like given this customer's email address, what's their account balance, we need to have already built that integration flow for that to work. So it's not automated. Or we might reach for something like GraphQL and do some kind of funkier, newer stuff in the GraphQL space. But again, we're still having to write resolvers. We're still having to build the connections between the services ahead of time. So again, cool, but not automated. So the first litmus test is, can it connect on demand? Can it do what I want it to do? The second one is, can it adapt? As I make changes, as I push changes into my organization, as I replace my database with an API, or as I take a series of APIs and replace them with a database, thus completing the circle of life, have we, you know, can, I, can my integration layer automatically adapt? Or do I have to go back into my drag and drop UI and fix it? Do I have to go and update my GraphQL resolver to say that method was a put, now it's a post? Or we've gone from HTTP to HTTPS, or someone's refactored that field name. So if I have to constantly go and maintain my integration layer, it is by definition not automated. So we want to build an automated data mesh. And in order to do it, in order to realize that vision, we need a lot of metadata in order to do it. Which brings us to semantic metadata. Now, we have no shortage of metadata today in the way that we build our systems, right? We are all creating open API specs. We might be churning out Protobuf, Avro, JSON Schema, DDL, RAML, RDF, what it, like whatever your GraphQL, whatever your schema language is of choice, you are producing schemas to describe your systems. 
or you're not, and you're doing it directly from code, and that's fine too. But this metadata, these things that we build to describe our systems, they tend to be very how-oriented. They talk about, here's how to connect to my service. Here's where it is. It's running on this port at this address. It's speaking HTTP, it's speaking HTTPS. These are the field names that you'll get back. So when you want to read my data, here's how to navigate the tree that you're getting back. Or they'll talk about, here's how to serialize data to, to send it onto a queue, or here's how to deserialize it to read it off. It's very how-oriented, very important, but it doesn't really talk much about what it is, what the information is that I'm getting out. It doesn't talk about how the integration from my service connects to your service. It doesn't talk about what the, what the relationships are between all of our data. And that's why we want semantic metadata. We want metadata that enriches our existing specs to describe the what, the semantics. And that's what Taxi is. It's a, it's a metadata language for describing data and services, not, about the, not so much about how to interact with them, but what you'll find when you get there how the data interacts, how it, um, how it relates. I'm going to talk about how to use these two things in combination to build an automated data mesh using semantic metadata. So that's the title of the talk. Let's begin. So I want to talk a little bit about structural versus semantic contracts, right? This is a big, this is a big concept that kind of underpins this. We touched on it briefly. Structural contracts are very much about the how. How do I do this, right? How do I connect to you? What protocol do I speak? What information do I need to give you? What are the fields name, field names you're gonna give me back? Versus semantic contracts that talk about what is the information I'm gonna find when I get there? What is the data that you're gonna give me? So if we take a look at this contract, right, here is a bit of pseudocode on the left with a customer, and he's got three fields. And then on the right, we have got a JSON representation of that same thing. So we've got three fields, an ID, a name, and an email. And if we look at this JSON blob, we kind of get what it is, right? Like, we can look at it and we can go, yeah, that's Jimmy. Like, I know Jimmy. He's got a cool email address. He's got a, a short, catchy, three-digit um, customer ID. I get it. The left-hand side on our domain, everything that we're looking at here is structural. It tells me the names of the fields that I can expect to receive if I want to interact with this blob of JSON, right? It's structure. Uh, more specifically, it's telling me, how do I navigate this map? That's really all it's saying, right? How do I, how do I navigate this map to find the stuff that you knew ahead of time would be there waiting for you? So if I was to change the structure, if I was to break that structural contract, everything would fall apart, right? I, if I, I can't just go into a JSON blob and change the name of a field from name to given name. That, that's just not allowed, it breaks the contract. That said, I can still look at the blob on the right and it still looks like Jimmy, right? The, the fact that I've renamed this field hasn't changed the meaning of the data that's there. It's just changed the way that I go to read it. Likewise, I can restructure it a bit more. I can take his email address and I can shove it down a level, wrap it up in this context object, rename, uh, changing the structure a bit further. But still, if I look at the blob, I can still like work out, I can still guess where his email address is. It's j at foo.com. But the reverse is not true. If I change his email address and I stick his postcode in there, we've broken a contract. The structural contract hasn't changed. This, the JSON that I was reading, I can still read, but I can't access his email address anymore. That's quite clearly the post, uh, postcode. I've broken a structural contract, but that, that semantic contract, sorry, it's not really represented on the left-hand side. There's no way for me to kind of understand or represent that this is supposed to be an email address other than a field name. If we expand that concept over a few different systems, so here we've got three different systems that want to chat to each other. We've got a customer system, we've got some cards with credit card information, and we've got a balance. Okay, again, three different um, pseudo contracts and three different blobs of data down the bottom that kind of that, that show the data that's coming out of them. And if we look at this, we can, if we squint a bit, we can start to see some relationships emerge between the data. And this is in practice, the way that we do integration today, right? You look at a blob adjacent, you fire it up in Postman, and you go, I recognize that number, and you stitch together ID and customer number. And so we can recognize that the data that's in here is related. Even though the field names are different, there's a contract between these two bits of information that if I was to break, stuff would fall apart. 
Likewise, our card number and account ID. The, the card number is exactly the same. It's present in both places, but the field names are completely different. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that one team called this field card number and another team called it account ID. It's a good thing, right? That's why we do domain-driven de design. It's why we have small autonomous teams, so I can create software that relates, that's meaningful to me as a team, rather than subscribing to some overarching naming principle. The reality is that the data that's in here is, it has a semantic contract. We're just not doing a great job in our, in our specs here of defining what it is. So it's, it's not a huge leap to explore then what that might look like if we were to start, this is really hard to see, but start um, tagging and introducing that the ID isn't just any old string, but it's a customer ID. And actually that the customer number in the cards model is the same semantic bit of information as the ID from the customer model. Semantically, there's a contract here. And so what we can start doing is introducing ways of modeling and defining that contract to start saying, Beyond this being just a string, there's actually, a some, there's actually a semantic contract associated with this data. We can then take those semantic contracts, we can start embedding them in our structural contracts. So we can, uh, we can embed them in our open API spec. We can say that this just isn't, a, isn't any old type, any old string, but it has a taxi type of customer ID. There's a semantic contract associated with this field. Or in my protobuf message, I can add some decorators to start saying what the meaning is of the data that I'll find here. Or if I'm code-based, I might just embed it directly in some annotations in, um, in Kotlin, or whatever your language of choice is. But I, can, I, I have mechanisms now to start enriching my structural schemas that I was already using to start saying, well, what am, what am I going to find here? So that kind of leads us into the idea of semantic metadata which I like to define as a collection of terms which form a semantic contract and are shared between systems. So let's break that down. Let's start with a collection of terms. And we've already seen this, right? Customer ID, card number, account balance. We've seen how we can start using these to describe the ideas in our data that's flowing around. It doesn't really matter what the field name is that I'm using to describe these. The semantic contract is what matters. You will find in this field a customer ID. You will find in this field a, a card number. So Taxi gives us a way of taking those ideas, those, those collection of terms, and turning them into a type system. So we end up with a strongly typed collection of terms. That lets us say that this is a customer ID that is also a string. A card number is a string and account balance is a decimal. And because it's a type system, it's rather, rather than just being a series of tags, it's an actual type system, we can start doing cool stuff with it. So we can say that actually this field is not just any old name, but it's a first name. And because it's a type system, all of the good old fashioned OO principles apply. So we can say that all first names are names, but not all names are first names. So we can inject specificity through the type system. Or sometimes we can inject context. Uh, context. If I'm in a transaction that has a buyer and a seller, both of whom are modeled by customer IDs, the context is actually really important. So we might want to say that this ID is not just any old customer ID, but it is a buyer customer ID and has a seller customer ID that goes with it. So because it's a type system, we can move up and down the abstraction levels to, to either inject specificity or inject context. Which takes us on to semantic contracts. So the idea of a semantic contract is scalar data elements that have the same semantic meanings. And, and really what we're saying here is that they don't have structure. So scalar in the sense that it's a string, it's a date, it's a Boolean, it's an integer, right? There's no structure involved here. That's actually a really important principle. For one, we've got great tools today in OpenAPI and Protobuf. We've already got great tools for modeling structure. What we're trying to fill the gap in here is what's the meaning of the data. We want to, and so the meaning is what's important, and we want to form consensus and agree around semantic meaning. So we saw this before. We saw that it doesn't really matter the name of the field. It doesn't matter hugely what's on the left of the colon. That's how software is going to navigate to get to the bit of information that I want. But the bit of information that I want is categorized with the tag on the right, with the type of customer ID or of card number. If we take a look at a slightly different example, if I imagine I've got two different systems that are, filming, uh, that are serving up film reviews for me. 
One is IMDb, another is Rotten Tomatoes. Both have the same field name of film ID. The field name is exactly the same. But if we look at the data, we can just look at that and go, that is not the same bit of information. They are not interchangeable. I cannot take the ID from IMDb and shove it into Rotten Tomatoes and expect to get something meaningful back. That just doesn't compute. So these pieces of information are semantically different. Therefore, they violate the semantic contract. We can't say that they are the same thing. We can namespace them. We could say that these are, one is a film ID in IMDb, one is a film ID from Rotten Tomatoes. And then because we have this nice type system, we can say they're both ID, they're both film IDs, but they're more specific than that. One relates to IMDb, one relates to Rotten Tomatoes. I could ask for a collection of all of the film IDs and I would get all of them back. Or I could ask for a collection of just the film IDs that relate to IMDb and I'll only get a subset back because we have a nice semantic type system. Finally, semantic contracts are great for sharing across systems. In fact, at this point, I would argue that semantic contracts are better for sharing across systems than structural contracts. And if we, if we drill into that a little bit, if we explore again the concept of structural versus semantic concept, uh, contracts, structural contracts change all the time. And we know this to be true because we have worked very, 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 very hard as an industry over the last 10 years to make this possible, right? I can destroy my entire AWS ecosystem and rebuild it with just a Terraform script. I can move something from HTTPS to HTTP. I can refactor a field name. I can tear down a database and replace it with an API. And I can deploy that API 30 times a day. So we are very, very, very good at making changes to structure. Where will I find this thing? Where can I interact with it? What protocol do I, uh, do I speak to it? We're really great at making those things change and we want the freedom to be able to make those things change. Semantics change a lot less frequently. My date of birth is my date of birth, regardless of whether it was served from a database query or over HTTPS. My customer ID doesn't change its meaning just because I got it back from a put versus a get. Right, the semantic meaning of that field, the semantic contract, doesn't change anywhere nearly as frequently as the structure that we use to serve the information. Structural contracts are really hard to form consensus around. It's, if you get a bunch of different engineers into a room and say, design the API, uh, design the customer domain model, that is not going to be a fun conversation, right? Because you've got lots of different people from lots of different teams where structure means different things by design. Again, that's a good thing. We've followed DDD principles, we've embraced microservices, we have different teams that care about things in different ways. So structurally, structural contracts are hard to, hard to agree on. Semantics are really easy. We've, we've already done it three times in this, call, in this um, uh, conversation. We've already agreed on customer ID. We've already agreed on account balance. Fair, I have the microphone, so it's made it easier. Structural contracts also tend to lead to tight coupling, right? If I take your open API spec and I pull it into my code, then whenever you change your open API spec, my code needs to change with you. We are by definition tightly coupled. Whereas semantic contracts, when I'm using these types, these small semantic types to talk about the data I want to find or the data that I'm going to give you, then it's, it's much looser. So in actual fact, you could go one step further and say that structural contracts are ideal for producers. Open API specs, protobuf, let me describe to you what you're going let me describe to you how to interact with me. But consumers, structural contracts, open API specs, they're a raw deal, right? That's a bunch of work that I'm signing up for. I'm not tightly coupled, oh, sorry, I'm tightly coupled if I'm pulling in your spec into my system. And that is true regardless of the integration pattern that you are using. If I'm, if I'm integrating with your system, if we've deployed a message bus to decouple producers and consumers, all I've done is moved the point of coupling from REST to the message bus because I'm still pulling in your protobuf spec. We are tightly coupled as soon as we share contracts. Whereas if we share semantics, we're nice and loose. So semantic metadata, a collection of terms which form a semantic contract and are shared across systems. Which leads us back to our title, building an automated data mesh using semantic metadata. I wanna drill in a little bit further into, into this idea of automation. How do, we, how do we automate this? So now that we understand 
what a semantic contract is and how I might design and, and deploy one across my organization, how do I use it to automate stuff? And our two litmus tests, can it connect on demand? And when I change stuff, can it adapt? So here's my three systems that I was looking at before, and this might be a little bit small, I'm sorry. On the left-hand side, we've got our customer system, which is a REST API. In the middle, we've got a SQL database. And on the, on the right, we've got our SOAP API for our transactional system. And because we now understand what semantic contracts are, we've embedded these semantic meta tags directly into our APIs. So then we can take those APIs and publish them somewhere. And by taking, all of the, taking that combination of structural metadata and semantic metadata, I can build this massive big graph, which I can start navigating. I understand all of a sudden, not just how to talk to your system, not just that it's a HTTP request on port 80 at this IP address, but I understand that what I'm going to get back is customer information in this collection of fields. And I understand what I need to give you in order to get that back. So when I get this requirement of given this email address, what is the customer's account balance? Even though for me to answer that question today, I have to integrate three different systems across three different protocols with three different API specs, there's enough metadata here through the combination of structural and semantic for me to work out the first thing I've got to do is take Jimmy's email address and do a REST API call to swap it from email address to customer ID, to then do a database query to swap his customer ID for a card number, before finally doing a SOAP request to go from card number to account balance and find out that Jimmy's got 29 quid on his account. So we didn't have to build that ahead of time. There was enough metadata there for us to be able to work it out between the combination of API specs and, meta and semantic metadata, there were enough breadcrumbs there for tooling to go, I know how to do this. And because we didn't have to build anything, when we inevitably rip out that SOAP API and replace it with gRPC, or when we take away that SQL database and stick a, um, an API gateway in front of it, because we didn't have to build the, the first round of integration, there's nothing for me to change. The API specs are republished with their richer metadata that tell me now where this information is and our integration layer can automatically adapt. And that's, so we have, a, we have a thing that does that, which is called Vine, but I mean, you can pretty much look at this and work out how to do it, right? I get, I get how to build graphs from semantic metadata. So now that we have this thing that is able to build the integration for us, we need a way to communicate it with it. We need a way to ask it, given this customer's email address, what's your account balance? We already have a collection of terms. We've already just used them for describing all of our producer APIs. They are a collection of terms that aren't coupled to any specific system. They just describe our business. So it means that I can say, given a customer ID of 123, find me their account balance. Okay, nice and simple. The same metadata that I used in order to write a question, in order to describe my APIs, I can use to ask a question. There's nothing here that talks about how. There's no join this table to that table. There's no do this request to that thing. It's because how is up to the mesh. Because how will change, but my requirement doesn't. Right? I want to stay decoupled from the different deployments that are going on. Frankly, it's not my, like, so long as the data that I'm getting back is accurate, I just don't care about how things are meant to change. Maybe I want more than just the account balance. Maybe I want a couple of fields. I want the customer name and the account balance. Here, rather than, here I'm actually, actually able to define a consumer contract that says, this is the information that I want, but also this is the way that I want it. And again, it doesn't really matter to me what the field name was that was applied at customer name, the system that was producing it. Whatever they happened to call it, don't care. I want it called name. So that when, for me, when that field changes its name, when it goes to a different system, when it adopts a different naming convention, it's not my problem, right? My integration code doesn't break. This is the contract that I want fulfilled. I want these bits of information for this customer ID, and I want it served to me looking like this. That's a customer contract, a consumer contract. So putting it all together, on the left, we've got Taxi, which is a semantic la language for describing data, letting me build up these semantic contracts. And on the right, we have a, um, a data product that lets us take all of those contracts, stitch it together, and serve up a data mesh, automating and adapting as we go. Demo. 
So this is our ecosystem. Um, so we are going to move past the world of customer IDs and account balances and into the highfalutin world of films. So we've got a bunch of different data services down the bottom. We're a film producing company. And so we've got a catalog of films that we have produced. Uh, we've got a REST API that tells me where I can watch it. Is it on Netflix? Is it on Hulu? Is it on HBO? We've got a uh, uh, REST API that gives me film reviews that tells me what people are saying. Is it any good? And then finally, we've got a Kafka topic that is streaming protobuf anytime Netflix reboots a 1980s franchise. So here we go, demo at a conference. This should go well. Oh, there we go. OK, so we have those semantic contracts that I was talking about that have been published up to Vine. So we can see here, for example, we've got a database that has film information. It gives me back a collection of films. And I, I can drill into that and start seeing how semantic metadata can be used to build this big mesh of data across my organization. We're not talking about protocols here. We're talking about tags of information. So I can see that I can get a film ID. It's got a title. It's got a description. And that film ID I can feed into another service that can give me back film reviews, for example. So by publishing up both the contracts that tell us where the data is and what it means, we can start doing cool stuff, like we can start asking for it back. So I can write a query that says, find me all of the films. And there we go, Academy Dinosaur, an epic drama of a feminist and a mad scientist. These are, these are randomly generated. Um, this is from a Postgres thing. <laughs> So there is, a, um, there is a collection of data coming back. Um, nothing particularly interesting going on there, but what we will notice is I haven't, spe I haven't specified how. I've just said what I want. OK, so I'm going to trim it back to just a handful of fields. Uh, OK, so I want the film ID. I want the name, which is a title. And give me the description. Actually, I might leave the description off. Uh, so there's the, um, there's the ID in the title. Um, nothing hugely interesting going on here yet. But let's enrich that to say, um, where can I watch this? Where can I watch this? So I want to know um, which streaming service is it on. So it is on, give me the name and give me the cost. And finally, is it any good? Is it any good? Give me the review of, give me the score and the text. Oops. OK, so now if I run my query, we're getting a bunch of information back, right? What's a little bit, so I'm getting the data back with the field names that I've asked for, complete with spelling mistakes to prove that this is a real thing. Um, but if we jump into the profiler and see what's actually going on, it's a little bit more interesting, right? So we can see that we ran a query against the database to get back our collection of films. And then we took the information from those films and we fed them into two different places. We fed them into, a, into one REST API that tells me where can I watch these, which streaming service has got it, and another one that tells me if they're any good to get the reviews back. We can drill into those in a little bit more detail. So if I go back into my table, if we take a look at the review score of 4.8, we can see the actual flow of data that, that went on, right? Because we're, we understand both semantically what data I need to provide, we can trace the lineage of this data to see how did I come up with this number. Well, we ran a query, it gave me a film ID, which I then fed into a review service to get back a score of 4.8. We understand how to do this automatically. I haven't had to talk about how to do this. All I've had to say is, this is what I want. So we didn't have to provide this um, up in advance. So if there's what the other test was, if I break something, if I make a change, will it adapt? OK, let's try it. So this is the code that is running my film review service. Um, and I'm, I apologize that it's very hard to see um, against, the monitor, against the thing. But basically, it's very simple. It's a, this happens to be Spring Boot. It's a very simple Spring Boot in Kotlin that is taking in a film ID and giving me back a film review. And as I mentioned earlier, these, these values have semantic contracts. So if I swap out my film ID, if we swap from our film provider being our in-house film IDs to now our new 
um, external service called Squash Tomatoes, where we're going to go and get all of our film reviews. And the data that it gives me back is no longer just has any old film ID, but has a Squash Tomatoes film ID. Now, if we jump back into, sorry, I'll just deploy that. So we're going to, um, I'm just going to bounce the service. All that will happen there is we'll republish the schema. So different semantic metadata. And if we take a look back in the app at the profiler that was going on, that we were running here, remember that in order to get this review information back, in order to get the text in the review, we were doing a database query that we then took the ID straight out of there and fed it into our review service. And we've just broken that because the ID that came out of our database doesn't work here anymore. That's a pretty significant change. If I rerun my query, okay, we're still getting the same data back, right? So for me as a consumer, even though my integration landscape has changed, for me to run the query, I didn't have to do any work. But if we jump into the profiler, we should see that there's a different integration path. So the ID that I got out of the database semantically wasn't good enough for me to pass directly into, an API, into another service. Instead, I had to go and do some other internal lookup to go, how do I swap from one ID scheme to another? And we all have these services running in our organization, right? The really, the really interesting part is not only was I not affected by that, for me as a consumer, I just don't care, right? The fact that there are 19 different ID schemes going on in my organization is not my day job. That is, how, that is stuff that I have to know about in order to deliver the integration. And so the less that I need to know about it, the less amount of archaeology that I need to do in order to find out how to string together the sequence of IDs, the better. Um, okay, I've clearly been talking fast because I normally ran out of time here. So I've got enough time for one more demo. Um, actually, a couple more. Why don't we... So this is being... Uh, why don't we introduce another breaking change? So rather than... So here's my, here's my service that is telling me about where I can go to watch it. Sorry. Let me blow that up. Here's my service that tells me where I can go to watch it, right? Again, data's just, um, just randomly done. It's a get request that sits on a URL. It takes a film, film ID and gives me back um, a structure of data up the top, which has names and price per month. So let's, let's, really, let's really mess that up. So I'm going to just comment out the old version. and bring in the new version. Okay, so what have we done? We've swapped our get for a post. We've broken the verb. We've changed what I was looking for. Before, we were just passing in an ID. Now I've got this whole request object that I need to construct. And the contract of the data is now much richer. Uh, so same deal, I'm just gonna redeploy that. And in a sec, we should see the schema update. Compiling, what are the odds? Um, so if we take a look at the profiler, while that's running, let's take a look at the profiler to understand what was going on. So we were taking this request coming out of our um, database query, we're passing it into a get request, which was giving us back two attributes. There we go. There we go, scheme has been updated. Okay, so let's rerun the query. Hang on. This is not a good sign from the demo gods. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's still doing its thing. Okay, I'm not gonna do that demo. We're gonna call it. <laughs> um, but it's a good time for me to stop and take questions, if anyone has any.